This conference will now be recorded. Tonight I'm going to tell you the story of Napoleon Bonaparte, and I'm only really going to talk about the time from him in Russia through Waterloo. I'll give you a little bit of context to get up to that point, but mostly I'm going to talk about the end of his career. I'm using for reference a book by a man named Andrew Roberts called Napoleon. And what he says is, is that few historical figures have greater name recognition, but, le but are less well understood. Hey, Jerry, mute everybody. I'm trying to. Oh, okay. Well, everybody mute yourself then. Thank you. Okay, George, you should be okay. Okay. He was perhaps the greatest military strategist who ever lived. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. He played a major role in shaping Europe. The Napoleonic Civil Code has influenced every republic and liberal democracy in the world, including our own. The Code Napoleon, and, and these are a set of principles that underpin the free world based on meritocracy, equality before the law, individual property rights, religious toleration, secular education, all were championed, consolidated and codified and geographically extended by Napoleon. And people don't know that about him. They think of him as more of a, an emperor out fighting battles, but he did a lot more than that. His maxims of war and what he emphasized was speed, attack the enemy's hinge points, never dilute your main force, are prime examples of how he was studied at military academy. Fred may or may not completely agree with me, but he was the only person studied as an individual soldier in what was a full year of history of the military art. We had an entire section devoted specifically to Napoleon and Napoleon's battles. They really, and, and if you think about it, his battles and his tactics and his principles had an awful lot to do with how the Civil War was conducted because all of those leaders studied Napoleon. My premise is that he's perhaps the greatest of all the great captains. And I'll talk some more about why I think that. But first I wanted to make a comparison and I wanted to compare him to Adolf Hitler. Bonaparte was called the little corporal. He started as a corporal. Hitler started as a corporal. They were the same height, they were both short. Their ascendancy came from revolution, both the French Revolution and then the Great Depression. Their downfall came in the same place, Russia. Their empire lasted exactly the same length of time, 11 years. Napoleon died at 52, Hitler died at 56. Who defeated them? Napoleon was defeated by a coalition of European powers. Hitler was defe defeated by a coalition of world powers. And then I show the successor on the world stage, first the British Empire and then the American Empire. I don't say all of that to say that they were that similar in terms of their individual characteristics, but there's an awful lot of facts there that are kind of surprising. Now, here's Napoleon's story just very, very briefly. He was born in Corsica in 1769. Corsica, when he was born, was Italian. Soon after he was born, it became a French territory. He distinguished himself as a young military commander fighting in Italy. He was a general in his early 20s. In 1799, 
he led a coup d'etat in France. He first installed himself as something called the first consul. Five years later, he crowned himself emperor of France. For the next decade, he fought and defeated five coalitions of European governments, all allied to stop his conquest. In 1812, he invaded Russia, but they did not play the way he wanted them to play. They retreated into the interior of the country. The Grand Army returned home through the Russian winter. And you might be surprised at what they call the Russian winter. I was surprised at what months it was that he actually was retreating in. In 1813, the Sixth Coalition defeated his forces at Leipzig. At that time, he was forced out of office and sent to Elba. He did not stay on Elba very long. He escaped Elba was reinstated and a hundred days later, Waterloo. So that's Napoleon Bonaparte in a very short overview. And Waterloo ended it all. And I'm gonna tell you quite a bit about Waterloo, perhaps more even than you wanted to know. But first some preliminary events. French Revolution lasted from 10 years, from 89 to 99. That revolution altered modern history more than the American Revolution did because it marked the decline of monarchies in the rest of the world, and in particular, the decline of the church. It also forecast the rise of democracy and nationalism. So the French Revolution was really a big deal in Europe. During the revolution, back now to Napoleon, it included the conquest of the Italian peninsula, all of the low countries, all of the territories west of the Rhine. And then ultimately it produced Bonaparte. The revolution collapsed in a coup that Napoleon led in 1799. At that time he established something called the First Empire. That set the stage for the global conflicts to follow. Before his foray into Russia, he had personally led troops in 50 major battles. He was the victor in 47 of those battles. That's not a bad batting average for a general. He built the strongest citizen army in the world. Remember now back in that era, and I can remember talking about the British army that fought in this country was mostly mercenaries. And that's what most armies were. A citizen army was an unusual event. He was a rare leader who was both adored by his soldiers and the people of France. Now I wanna talk about the Tar Baby. The tar Baby is Spain. Napoleon chose to invade Spain in 1807. And exactly why he did that's not real clear. But one of his primary reasons was that he wanted to drive England out of Portugal. By 1807, he had been defeated at the Battle of Trafalgar by Nelson. And he was smarting from that defeat. That meant he could not invade England. And so what he wanted to do was drive England out of the Iberian Peninsula. Initially, his forces were successful. He was not there personally for very much of this, but he put his brother Joseph on the throne of Spain. It was not the only relative or only one of his marshals that were put on thrones of these various countries. That was one of the things that Napoleon did. He put his marshals on several different thrones. Now there's, you can look at that map and you can see there were so many battles going on in Spain, there's just too many to enumerate, but Spanish guerrillas made the occupation a prolonged nightmare. They never really subdued Spain. The guerrillas that were in Spain, and this was in the early 19th century now, 
made the occupation a nightmare. By 1812, there were 300,000 French troops in the Iberian Peninsula, and they were consistently on the defensive. And when he went into Portugal, he usually got his nose bloodied by the British who were leading the troops there. On June the 21st, 1813, 80,000 Allied troops under Wellington, and we're going to talk some more about Wellington later, routed the 66,000 army of Joseph Bonaparte and Jordan at Vittoria, which is a place 175 miles northwest or northeast of Madrid. So in Spain, he had a huge number of troops tied down almost the entire time of his empire and he never really was able to establish the kind of control there that he was trying to establish and eventually he was defeated by wellington now the russian campaign in 1812 by 1812 he had conquered all of europe except spain and actually, you could say he conquered Spain. He had it by 1812, only two adversaries left, England and Russia. Everyone else, all the rest of these countries were actually allied with Napoleon and provided troops for him for his invasion of Russia. However, he knew that the Tsar was considering an alliance with England. Further, the Tsar was considering invading the French Empire. They wanted to recapture Poland. So he saw the Tsar here in Russia as a threat. By then, Napoleon had an army of 600,000 men, as I said before, including the forces of his allies the Prussians, the Austrians, uh, the Romanians, just as Hitler had. Russian forces in Russia were less than 200,000. His intention was not to conquer Russia, it was to force the Tsar to negotiate a truce. And he felt that he had the army big enough, strong enough, deadly enough, that the, the czar would see that it was a hopeless situation and he would sign a truce with Napoleon, as had all the rest of Europe except England. The Grand Army crossed the Neiman River June the 24th, 1812. Just for uh, an interesting sideline, Barbarossa was unleashed by Hitler June the 22nd, 1941. So he went in to Russia at almost exactly the same time as Hitler did. Napoleon's objectives were twofold. One was to defeat the Russian army, which he was very confident that he could do. And the second was just the capture of a provincial capital in Smolensk. He had no intention of going any further than Smolensk when he invaded. In mid-August, that's six weeks later, there was a battle in Smolensk. It was the first major battle of the invasion. It was a French victory. And they were accustomed at that time, after you lost a major battle, to sue for peace and to make a truce, truce pity. But the Russians, instead of doing that, withdrew. So Napoleon actually sat in Smolensk with his army. By the way, this 600,000 men were not all in one place. As Hitler did later, he had a large army in the north and he had another army in the southeast. So his main army was nowhere near 600,000 in the middle throughout the entire country of Russia was the 600,000. He sat in Smolensk and waited for the Russians to quit 
and they would not. He had a council of war with his marshals. They told him not to pursue. He chose to pursue them, thinking that one more victory and they would quit, even as his army bled. In early September, the following month, the Russian army was again defeated at the Battle of Borodino, and badly defeated, by the way. If you read War and Peace, it's about the Battle of Borodino. The Russian general's name was Kutuzov. He had wanted to continue to withdraw from contact with Napoleon. Finally, the Tsar said, stand and fight or I'll replace you. He, stand, he stood and fought and he was defeated at Borodino. But again, the Russians did not quit. Therefore, Napoleon entered Moscow and he was waiting for a surrender that did not come. And it's interesting to read in the book about what he did while he was in Moscow. First of all, the Russians set fire to the city. Much of the city was destroyed, not by the French, but by the Russians as they retreated. But he sat there for more than a month waiting for a representative from the Tsar to come and say, I want to sue for peace, and they did not come. They would not negotiate. Napoleon began his retreat. By now, the Central Army was down to 110,000 men in October. And when you think about October, you don't think about the Russian winter. But I don't think any of us have ever been in Russia in October, and it may be a lot worse than we think it is. Anyway, he actually started his retreat the 19th of October. By November the 6th, the first snow fell, following by alternative thaws and frosts until early December. In early December is when the bitter cold set in. And the numbers they quote in the book, I can't believe. The temperatures went below zero in early December and stayed there, day and night, according to this book. I'm not sure what they were using for a thermostat. The Russians followed the French. They dogged them from their flanks throughout their entire retreat. There would be periodic engagements, but not large engagements. And the Grand Army continued to bleed. On December the 5th, he was back to the Neiman. He handed over the command to Marat, and Marat was one of his marshals. And he hastened to Paris before the news of the disaster reached Paris. And he was actually afraid, and legitimately so, that while he was gone, there would be a coup d'etat in Paris. And there was an uprising. However, they did not overcome the government that he had left behind. 600,000 combatants entered Russia. Less than 100,000 returned. 100,000 were killed in action, 200,000 died from other causes, mostly from the weather, 50,000 were left in hospitals, 50,000 deserted, and 150,000 were left in Russia as POWs. And this number's going to come back into the story a little bit later on. Now, what happened after Russia? If you think that Russia was the end, you missed something. He returned to France and he rebuilt the army. And his plan was, what do I do now? And what he decided to do now was rebuild the army to 350,000 men. However, he could not replace the cavalry forces that he lost. Next, he decided to invade Prussia. That's where he went next with this army. His withdrawal from Russia had opened the floodgates, though. One by one, all of these allies became former allies. They became members of something known as the Sixth Coalition. 
Now he marched into Prussia. His intention was to force the Prussians to give up and return to their place in his empire. He won two battles in May of 1813, a place called Lutzen and another place called Bautzen. However, in both battles, he suffered as many casualties as did the Allies. At Leipzig, and Leipzig might be a name you've heard, he was outnumbered more than two to one. He did not have his cavalry with the same level of skill that he had in the past, and he was defeated in a four-day battle in October of 1813. Casualties at the Battle of Leipzig were over 100,000 men. For comparison, that is quite a bit more severe than Gettysburg, as an, ex as an illustration. Exile. He retreated from Leipzig in, in good order, as opposed to when he left Russia. However, the Allied powers <coughs> quickly occupied Paris. The government told Napoleon that he had to abdicate, and the Treaty of Fontainebleau was signed 11 April 1814 with Austria, Russia, and Prussia. Napoleon was exiled from France, and he was actually exiled as the Emperor of Elba. Elba is this little 10 by 15 mile island off the coast of Italy, just between Italy and Corsica. So that's where they sent him the first time. He attempted suicide with a pill that he had been carrying since Moscow and he was unsuccessful. He was conveyed to the island as a prisoner of the British on HMS Undaunted, 30 May, 1814. While he was on Elba and he wasn't there very long, he immediately created a Navy and an army, started developing the iron mines on Elba, oversaw the construction of new roads, issued decrees on modern agricultural methods, and overhaul the island's legal and educational system, all as a defeated emperor of France. Now, he escaped from Elba. He remained in exile a grand total of 10 months. At the Congress of Vienna, and that's where they were talking about what were they going to do about Napoleon, they squabbled about the distribution of the spoils. They were not able to reach agreement. It was the Congress of Vienna was very similar to the Treaty of Versailles, where the Allies squabbled about what to do about the Germans. The Russians released the 150,000 men of the army captured in the Moscow campaign. The Royalists, the King of France, had been reinstated back in Paris, considered an exile further away. But they just talked about it. There's a lot of talk that goes on in France and not so much action. On 26 February, 1815, the British guard ships were on some other duty temporarily. Napoleon slipped away with a thousand men and landed near Cannes. He found himself warmly received firing no shot in his defense. His troop numbers swelled until they became an army. He started marching from Cannes to Paris. Interesting, Marshal Ney, who was one of Napoleon's commanders, but now one of Louis XVIII's commanders, said that Napoleon ought to be brought to Paris in an iron cage. And he was sent out from Paris with a brigade of men to capture Napoleon. Instead, he joined Napoleon with those 6,000 men. Five days later, Napoleon entered the capital, Louis XVIII taking the powder. Napoleon immediately dissolved the government and resumed his role as ruler. The Hundred Days, 
after his escape from Elba, Napoleon ruled for 100 days. His first priority was to reestablish the Grand Army. Remember, that's a citizen army. By the end of May, he had reassembled this army. Against him, in the Seventh Coalition, were forces from Austria, Germany, Spain, and Russia. They were all sent towards the Rhine to deal with Napoleon. A Prussian army, and this is a specific one, under Blücher, took post alongside Wellington's British army, which was in Belgium. Now, this is what the forces looked like in 1815. If you see the blue, they were spread out around the perimeter of France. The strategic situation in, in Western Europe was 250,000 Frenchmen faced 850,000 Allied soldiers on four fronts. Not only that, Napoleon had to leave 20,000 men around Paris to reduce a, a royalist insurrection that was going on. I thought you might be interested in a little bit of information about the Duke of Wellington. His name was Arthur Wellesley. He was the first Duke of Wellington. He was an Anglo-Irish soldier. He was a leading military and political figure of 19th century Britain. He served twice as prime minister of Great Britain. He was commissioned as an ensign in the British Army in 1787. He was also elected as a member of parliament in the Irish House of Commons. By 1796, he was a colonel. He saw action in both the Netherlands and in, in India. You can tell from these dates, he missed the American Revolution. He became a general during the Peninsula Campaign of the Napoleonic Wars. He became a field marshal after his victory against the French Empire at the Battle of Victoria in 1813 that I mentioned earlier. He fought 60 battles in his career. So he spent a lot of time on the battlefield. He ended the Napoleonic Wars when he defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. In 1828, he resigned as commander in chief of the army and became prime minister of Great Britain. So he kind of presaged Eisenhower. Eisenhower is the only American that I know, of. maybe you could say Grant, Grant and Eisenhower, who became the leader of their country. Now, this is what the 100 days campaigns looked like on a big scale. There was fighting going on down in, Rome, in Italy. Several different places in Italy. There was fighting going on at the Battle of Ochoa, Ochoa Bello, and I don't know exactly where that is, between Marat and the Austrians. The King of Naples declared war on Austria. And then finally, Wellington and Blucher's victory at Waterloo. So it wasn't just Waterloo that was the end of Napoleon's career. It was going on all over Europe. Now, Napoleon on the offensive. Napoleon was like Robert E. Lee. He did not believe in setting up a defense and letting the uh, enemy come to you. By the start of June, 1815, his forces had reached 300,000, but as I said before, they were spread out. He decided to go on the offensive and to drive a wedge between the oncoming British army here and the Prussian army over here. French Army of the North, here from Charleroi, crossed the frontier into the United Kingdom of the Netherlands in modern day Belgium in the middle of June, 1815. The Battle of Waterloo itself was actually four different battles. <coughs> the first one was the Battle of Ligny. He was fighting against Blucher's Germans. The second one was Quatre Bras, where he was fighting some of Wellington's forces. The third one was the Battle of Wavre, again versus Blucher. And then finally, Waterloo unfolded. 
The first three were all French victories. So by the time the actual Battle of Waterloo occurred, the French were winning the battle with these allied forces. The fate of Europe and of France hung in the balance. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about it. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the, the British square. The British square was a fighting square during the Napoleonic Wars. I had heard of it. I wasn't sure I knew what it was. The infantry used it primarily to defend against a cavalry attack. Ranks of soldiers formed a hollow square. And at its center, they had artillery, their animals, and their baggage. All four flanks were thus protected. The square itself could move as a unit, albeit slowly. It proved effective against the French. It became a symbol of the supremacy of the British Army. They used it in Africa quite a bit later on. Talk specifically about a place called Hugomal. Hugomal was a farm down here in this corner of the battlefield at Waterloo. It is the symbol of Waterloo and Napoleon's defeat. Wellington recorded in his dispatches, at 10 o'clock, Napoleon commenced an attack upon our post at Hugomont. The fighting was characterized initially as a diversion. Napoleon was attacking in this area to draw in Wellington's reserves, but it didn't work that way. It became an all-day battle and it drew in the French reserves instead. There's a good case to believe that both Napoleon and Wellington thought that holding Hugomont was key to winning the battle. It was the extreme right flank of Wellington's army and the left flank of Napoleon. The French never captured Hugomont. In the middle of Waterloo, there were two different battles. First, the French attacked the center of Wellington's line. Here, they gained very little. The British heavily, heavy cavalry counterattacked. That was also inconclusive. The French Imperial Guard attacked, but it foundered under another counterattack. The British and French fighting in this area eventually ended with the French in retreat because over on the right side of the battlefield, the Prussians were in contact with Napoleon's right flank. As the French were assaulting Wellington Center, the Prussians here were folding the French right flank. By the end of the day, the French left, center, and right had all folded and retreat turned into a rout. Now I've got something to show you that I think is kind of interesting, and it's what the battle looked like 11 o'clock in the morning. Here's Hugomont here. You see the French attacking Hugomont, the British reinforcing it. The French add more troops, the British reinforce more. The French attack, attack the center. The British counterattack. By 1700, Blucher is on the field attacking the right flank. By 1800, the French are in terrible condition. By 2100, they collapse. I think this is an interesting picture. The end in St. Helena. Waterloo cost Wellington 15,000 casualties and Blucher 7,000. Just for a rough example, that's 22,000 out of a total of 75,000 engaged in one day. Very comparable to Antietam. Napoleon lost 25,000 killed or wounded, with 7,000 casual captured and 15,000 desertions over the following day. Napoleon from 
Waterloo fled to Paris. He announced his second abdication on 24 June 1815. Louis XVIII was restored to the throne of France. Napoleon was captured by the Allies. The Treaty of Paris was signed in November 1815. That treaty had more punitive terms than the treaty of the previous year. France was ordered to pay 700 million francs in indemnities and all of the borders that had been expanded from back in the early part of the French Revolution were reduced to their 1790 level. Napoleon was exiled to St. Helena and if you look at where St. Helena is, it's nowhere he's going to come back to France from. He died there in 1821. Allegedly, he was poisoned. I don't, uh, they, they've actually taken samples of his hair, and the samples of his hair show that he had arsenic in his system. Now, whether or not there was enough to kill him, I don't know, or why they would kill him. Conclusions. Waterloo was a decisive battle in more than one sense. Every generation in Europe, all the way up to the outbreak of the First World War, looked at Waterloo as the turning point that dictated the course of world history. The battle ended a series of wars that had convulsed Europe and it involved many other regions of the world since the French Revolution of the early 1790s. It also ended the first French Empire and the political and military career of Napoleon Bonaparte, one of the greatest commanders and statesmen in history. France was never again the center of Europe. Do you have any questions, guys? Is there anybody there? George, it, it seems <clears throat> I didn't realize that they'd been fighting over Poland way back in the early 1800s, but poor, I sort of feel sorry for Poland. Poland has been on the crossroads. If you want to read a, an interesting book, <coughs> Michener wrote a book called Poland, yeah. and it tells you about the various <clears throat> incursions into, through Poland. It's conquered by just about everybody it's just it has no natural defenses it's just a pawn in european history well it seems like it's been the doormat you know for everybody for over 200 years it's yeah. more than that the, the book George, 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 did you read the earlier book? than that did you read that book are you talking to me yeah yes really? yeah i i tried to i got halfway through and i couldn't make i couldn't keep things straight through that <laughs> it got, Thanks, it got, it got so, so mixed up everybody was going which way you know it's true <laughs> yeah excellent program george well thank you i'm at the lake i gotta leave okay alden well, i've always been interested in in how napoleon kept the british so busy through the War of 1812 until the Battle of New Orleans. And, and it was actually good for us that they were so busy in Europe. Absolutely. Unmanned. We, I don't think we would have won that war had it not been for Napoleon keeping them preoccupied. If you read about, you know, the British didn't have that large an army ever. No. They hired mercenaries. That was their, that was their approach to to uh taking care of military george is, do you still have your book on the uh, from west point on napoleon i think i do but i'm not sure where it is fred i've got, I've got it if you want to look at it okay <laughs> I, i'm pretty sure i've got the battle maps but remember how much time we spent on napoleon yeah he he was he was really looked at as as the gospel. Okay.
Yeah. It's an outstanding presentation. I, I didn't Enjoyed know. It, George. 